What's up, everybody? Uh, back here again with another voiceover league. So we played uh, a little bit of this Zoo Shadow list on stream yesterday, and we played a, a second league that I didn't get uh, recorded for YouTube, so I wanted to come back over, give a little bit of commentary and uh, thought process on that league, and then we'll get that up on YouTube so y'all can check this out if you didn't happen to catch the stream live, which, as always, the link to the live stream is right down below at twitch.tv slash the underscore control freak, uh, spelled just like in the YouTube video. Also have a link to the Discord, uh, as well as the deck list presented here on Stream Decker. So let's go ahead and consolidate a little bit of this so everybody can see everything. Uh, so the league we played first yesterday, we kind of swapped out uh, the Mishra's Bobbles for some Neshoba Brawlers. We swapped out something else for something not important. We're on to a new league now. Uh, this league, we moved the Teferis to the sideboard for Ren and Six in the main deck. We dropped the Tarmogoyfs completely. Uh, we dropped the Dramoka's commands completely. And we're throwing in some Tribal Flames. Huge, huge interest from everybody watching to see what Tribal Flames had to offer. So I thought we would go ahead and get a video with Tribal Flames included. It's a card that... I personally am not very supportive of, but I also don't play a lot of Zoo. I play a lot of Shadow, and in Shadow, Tribal Flames is not going to be a very effective card. So this is kind of our, our compromise. I'm going to try out Tribal Flames. I'm going to give it an honest opinion. We'll see how it plays out. Otherwise, in the main deck, for our interaction, we've got like four Lightning Bolt, four Stubborn Denial, four Thought Seize, four Leyline Bindings, a whole bunch of fours, two March of Otherworldly Light, which we played in our first league with kind of this iteration, and it worked out extremely well. So wanted to go back and showcase it a little bit more. Uh, we've got our Threat Package for Death Shadow, for Ragavan, for Neshoba Brawler, for Territorial Kavu. Again, really heavy on the four ofs. Kind of figure if a threat's good enough to make it in the deck, we want to see it. In the sideboard, a couple copies of Fluster Storm and an Alpine Moon, two Veil of Summer. We cut the two Nature's Claims for two wear, or the two Natural States for two wear and tears. Uh, dropped the second Engineered Explosives for a Lavinia. We moved the two Teferis to the sideboard over the two Geists of Taint Trap. Uh, threw in a, a spicy little Knight of Autumn here to kind of help out with some of the artifact and enchantment hate. But anyway, this is the list. Let's go ahead and go over the first match. Don't want to hold you people up too much. All right. So, match number one. Lose the die roll. Reveal our Pokemon. Uh, so, opening hand. The big thing to keep in mind with this deck is the, the mana base is still evolving, still growing. It's not perfect. Uh, we're a lot more black-based than your traditional zoo list, especially wanting early access to black with Thought Seize and potentially turn to Death Shadow. So we've got to keep that in mind with our fetching. Some of the things that we've changed up recently is we included a couple copies of Scalding Tarn over some Verdant Catacombs. Scalding Tarn lets us get uh, Blood Crypt, Steam Vents, Sacred Foundry, Savai Triome Breeding Pool. So a lot of flexibility there. We added in a Temple Garden. Not one you would normally expect in like a Death Shadow type build, but pairs very well with Blood Crypt or Steam Vents to help get a bunch of those colors online. Let us cast our red-green cards on too. So 
some of the uh, the decisions for what we're fetching and when are still getting worked out. So if you see something where we obviously fetched wrong, feel free to leave a comment down below. Let me know so that I can start working on adjusting what I'm looking for at certain points of the game. Uh, so right here, we've got a, a Thoughtseize and a Kavu. We've got the ability to go get a, a black source on turn one. We can get like Overgrown Tomb off of our Windswept Teeth to be able to Thought Seize. Turn two, Steam Vents for Kavu gives us a 4-4 four, four Kavu. And then we can always either play like a Tap Savai Triome or we can just fetch out like a Sacred Foundry and have the Savai Triome to cycle later. That makes our Kavu a 5-5 five, five on turn three. So, opponent mulligans lead off with a Ketria Triome and pass. So, the immediate guesses off of Ketria Triome for me are going to be like, it could be uh, creativity, it could be some sort of a Rhino's deck. I know Living In sometimes plays a, a Triome. So... Something like that. Ah, slow down. So, Thought Seize sees a Dwarven Mind, which is pretty big giveaway for a creativity list. We see Double Fable the Mirror Breaker. Uh, the, no, it's just one Fable of the Mirror Breaker. So, Thought Seize, Dwarven Mind, Fable of the Mirror Breaker, Fire and Ice, and Blood Grip. I decide to take the fable of the mirror breaker leave them with fire and ice uh dwarven mine blood crypt and a second fire and ice so that's what it was there's two or no ah it's such a pain looking at like the revealed thing over here so it's like oh they revealed dwarven mine fable of the mirror breaker ice fire fire and ice <laughs> But either way, I took the value card. I'm really expecting them to just like tap down my Kavu here. I could have taken uh, the Fire and Ice, got my Kavu down unimpeded on turn two. Then they would have been able to Fable on three, make the token. And between having to deal with the, uh, the token itself, so they can't make a bunch of treasures and ramp, and having to deal with the card filtering of the Fable of the Mirror Breaker. I decided to take it, and I'll just, like, take my punishment of not being able to play a Kavu this turn. So I can still just shock in the Steam Vents, hold up Stubborn Denial, so maybe if they go for another Fable, I can interact with it. Again, like, I know... They have another land in hand. They haven't gotten to really filter yet. So it's kind of hit or miss on this reunion. Them playing out Dwarven Mine right there means I feel like I hit a home run with countering the Bitter Reunion. Because this way they can't play a third land and then Dwarven Mine on four to make a token to creativity. Now they could have drawn a second Dwarven Mine. But got to play with the information that you have. Hope y'all can't, like, hear the individual mouse clicks. Let's move the microphone a little bit away from the mouse. All right, so we've got Kavu online all the way. I'm fine trading this Ragavan out for the uh, the token here. Our opponent missed their land drop last turn. So the thing is, I don't want them to have access to another mana. Uh, which they're going to have the loot from Fable, so it's likely they can find one. But... Got to do what you got to do. Uh, we did have... This was one of those times where I should pay attention more to my fetches. So I fetched out Sacred Foundry with the Wooded Foothills. 
while I had the Scalding Tarn in hand. I could have fetched out a Temple Garden. Um, I wanted to hold up blue in case Territorial Kavu filtered into a, a Stubborn Denial. I could have fetched out Temple Garden here and gotten Sacred Foundry off the Scalding Tarn. Uh, that way I could have like played my land, dashed the Ragavan, uh, had open white in case I drew a Leyline Binding, blue in case I drew a Stubborn Denial. But because I got Sacred Foundry and used that to dash the Ragavan, um, I ended up not being able to hold up double white or hold up white if I played the Spy Triumph. I also could have gotten a Blood Crypt and dashed the Ragavan first instead of tapping the Sacred Foundry, but I just wasn't preparing myself to draw a white card there. So that's a point of improvement for me going forward is hey, keep in mind what you can draw off Kavu. So them ditching double Archon means if they have a, uh, a persist here, I'm probably in a lot of trouble. Thankfully, they do not. But they are going to have a lot of looks at a persist. Another Kavu is reasonable. Luckily, Territorial Kavu's got this fun little text where when he attacks, you can either discard a card, draw a card, or you can exile a card from a graveyard. So Kavu's pretty good at starting to exile a lot of these uh, persist targets. And I could have Tribal Flames the way that Token um, wouldn't be the worst idea in the world. But I kind of figure, like, especially if they find another land, they've got plenty of targets for a creativity. So I'm not going to be able to get rid of all of them regardless. But we're a okay with a Renin six here. All right. So the other mode on Kavu, uh, you can stack these Kavus together, so you don't have to resolve both abilities like at the same time. You resolve one, then resolve the other. So we could resolve the first one, discarding the Scalding Tarn. And then depending on what we see off of that, we can make our decision on the second discard. Uh, here, I've got Lethal Burn. I can play around Spell Pierce. They've only got one blue mana available. So, like, I know my opponent's dead here. So, they can block however they want. That's fine. Go ahead and uh, throw some burn spells at them. I should have marked that. I was keeping track as this league was going on of how many times we killed our opponent with Tribal Flames. Or, like, killed our opponent because we had Tribal Flames. And this should have been a mark here. Even though I killed them with Bolt, uh, we needed a total of seven damage. Double Bolt wouldn't have gotten there. So we needed the Tribal Flames damage to, to finish them off there. But fortunate they weren't able to find a creativity or a persist. So a little bit of luck game one. Uh, going into game two, board out like all these Ragavans. They're way worse on the draw than on the play because your opponent's got access to like Lightning Bolt, Ren and Six, Down Tick, Fire and Ice. Uh, just a whole bunch of ways to deal with the Ragavan. So it's uh, definitely the weaker of our potential turn one plays. Uh, board out a tribal flames because it's a sorcery space sorcery uh, speed removal spell that is pretty rough when your opponent has the ability to just like make a token and immediately creativity it creativity it on their turn. 
um, boarded in a single copy of Unlicensed Hearse, boarded in the Engineered Explosives. I thought about boarding in the Teferis, but honestly, I think this matchup uh, from this kind of build is a lot less counter magic related and more us getting like a good clock and then uh trying to interact with the tokens so i'm not so worried about them like countering my spells uh the other board in is what uh fluster storm Two Fluster Storm and an Alpine Moon. Because Alpine Moon stops Dwarven Mind from triggering and Fluster Storm fights on the stack. So. Uh, opening hand, one land, land doesn't cast Neshoba Brawlers or Stubborn Denial. We're a ways off of the shadow. Tribal Flames is just like a two-mana Sorcery Speed Burn spell isn't doing anything. So we're throwing that back pretty quick. This is a lot better. Uh, early Fluster Storm. We've got Renin 6 to get our lands together. Shadow is a clock. So let's go ahead and get rid of one of these Tribal Flames. And you can kind of watch the, uh, the progression a little bit as we go. Uh, and I talked about it a little bit at the end, but since we didn't record that part of it, I'll mention it uh, some as we go along. I think that Tribal Flames as like a burn spell, just a deal a bunch of damage burn spell, is like a B plus grade card. Uh, like five damage is a very sizable chunk. So... Uh, definitely not something to be underestimated. But I think Tribal Flames as an interactive spell, a kill spell, a burn spell, is like a C-. Um, it's for two mana at sorcery speed what a lot of cards can do for one mana at instant speed. Like, you're not really killing a whole lot with Tribal Flames that you couldn't kill with Bolt or Unholy Heat, Fatal Push. Something like that. Um, so it's just significantly worse. But you got to put it somewhere between those as a flexible card. So maybe the card gets like a, a B minus overall grade for me. Uh, so Renin 6 ticks up. We want to get the Overgrown Tomb so that we can double Black Spell next turn with Thought Seize Shadow, hold up Fluster Storm. Fable's a little unfortunate. Alright, it's a really good hand out of them. They've got Creativity, they've got Bolt. Uh, decide to take the bolt so that I can get down this shadow without fear of it dying right here. And if they have a land and go for, uh, like, land, attack with shaman, make a token, creativity, target the token, I can still fluster storm that. But I didn't want them to be able to, like, bolt and down tick the wren on my uh, shadow. Attack in. Blocking here. Hoping they didn't draw another bolt, which they did. <laughs> so there goes that clock. Uh, we could have chosen not to block there, but honestly, I don't think not blocking really does anything for us. Like, we just give them the ability to get more mana and just pay for Fluster Storm next turn. So, 
I also get a tribal flames to Ren at some point, but like once they get the the fourth land and they've got Fable, getting extra lands is kind of trivial. And creativity, but they can just pay for Fluster Storm. And we'll kind of give it a draw here because we can kill the Archon. But opponent's got six cards in hand. I know they've got another Archon that they're only a few turns away from hard casting. So ultimately, like, even if I kill this Archon, I'm not anywhere near having a chance. They've got a uh, Ren Emblem next turn if they want it. Just one of those games that I felt like I was a turn behind most of the game. Like, maybe I should have gone... Uh, did I have the Thought Seize turn two? If my only play was Ren turn two, it was fine. If I had the Thought Seize, maybe I should have Thought Seized on two and taken something like Fable of the Mirror Breaker. But... Either way, we get to come back to game three on the play, and we are much happier on the play than the draw. Uh, hand's fine. We can get, like, Breeding Pool into Blood Crypt. That gives us uh, Mountain Swamp, uh, or Island Forest Mountain Swamp. For Neshoba Brawler, it would be a 4-3. Then the Plains makes it a 5-3. We've got Leyline Binding up. We've got Stubborn Denial up. So, uh, either one of these lands can get uh, Blood Crypt, or this one can get Blood Crypt, this one can get Breeding Pool. We can also get, um, oh, what was it? Temple Garden. No, uh, not Temple Garden. I know there's another combination here. Uh, Savai Triome Breeding Pool, same thing. This is probably actually better, Savai Triome Breeding Pool, because this gives us our second white source in case we need to double Leyline Binding. And kind of the downside is we just can't Stubborn Denial on turn one, but there's not really anything they're doing on turn one that you care about stubborn denialing. So Thought Seize is a really good pick up there. Take Fluster Storm. We don't care about Ren and Six, like we're outpacing that really well. Uh the Shova Brawler having trample is very relevant against uh against this deck because they can't just like throw a whole bunch of dwarf tokens in front of you. Get rid of the Wren. Mostly I just decided to get rid of the Wren so I don't have to worry about looping uh besage you like if they want to besage you my leyline binding and get back the Ren, cool i'm gonna kill them um but if they start like hitting my lands i don't have that many blue sources in the deck like breeding pools steam vents i think that's it there's no water grave no hollowed fountain yeah so it's just a breeding pool and the steam vents so either way Quick match, or quick game three at least. Uh, Neshoba Brawler looking solid there. Obviously the downside of Neshoba Brawler being that it can be lightning bolted. And you just kind of have to hope they don't have a lightning bolt. <laughs> but the trample was actually relevant in some of these games. Alright, on the play... Hand's fantastic. Like, we could go turn one Ragavan uh, off, like, a Sacred Foundry. Uh, we could get a... Oh, 
what we get overgrown tomb and ley line binding on two or overgrown tomb rend down pick round tick down tick a whole bunch of options Third land means as long as this overgrown or this wooded foothills gets like overgrown tomb, we've got all of our colors covered. All right, so mountain lava dart makes me assume some sort of like prowess deck. So I'm going to be a little more conservative with my life total. Get Ren going. A little more conservative than my life total as I'm sitting here. Fet shock thought sees. All right. I'm going to take third path iconoclast because that card looks terrifying. They don't have another threat, so we'll just go ahead and ley line binding the soul scar mage. I don't know if this deck runs like spell pierce in the main deck, uh, but I can kind of afford to play around it, so might as well. So I had to dash the ragman. I'm really hoping that they'll just uh, lightning bolt this so that I can get this brawler down. But they actually end up going ahead and sacking the land for the lava dart, uh, which I was not expecting. Like I get the uh, the idea of being mana efficient. And not really wanting to like waste your three damage spell on a one mana creature. But at the same time, like with Iconoclast and maybe something like Sprite Dragon, uh, maybe light up the stage, I don't know. There's a really good chance that they want to be or want to have like a critical mass of mana as well. So just going ahead and like sacking your third land drop, even if you have extras. Uh, it's a little strange. And then I don't really know why the scoop here. Uh, they know I've got at least one land in my hand. Ren Emblem's not doing anything with Thought Seize, and I'm at nine life. They can kill the Neshoba Brawler. So somebody's going to scream paid actor over that one. Sideboarding. Uh, took out a couple Ragavans because we saw Lava Dart. Couple thought sees, especially on the draw, brought in like engineered explosives, brought in Knight of Autumn, and other ones are Bluster Storm. Bluster Storm, EE, -E, Knight of Autumn. Uh, one lander on the draw. We've got Bolton Leyline Binding, and Windswept Teeth can get Sacred Foundry. But that means we can't cast a Shoba Brawler or Shadows. If we get Breeding Pool, we can't cast Leyline Binding, Bolt, or Shadows. So I think we kind of have to throw this back for something a little more uh, mana conducive, which we find here, like. Double March of Otherworldly Light plus an EE is a, a pretty good variety. No threat, so Fluster Storm doesn't do a whole lot for us. All right, Kavu's pretty nice. We'll take two. If they did decide to go like, mutagenic, mutagenic or something, then we could always fetch up a uh, temple garden in like March, exiling the other March to be able to take out either one of their creatures.
All right. Thought about playing Kavu here. Uh, ultimately decided not to. I could have played EE on one and held up March. Might have been okay, but like it represents killing both of the creatures. So. But I'm really hoping that I can just like find another um uh, another land and mark something else. But like mutagenic growth there is pretty rough for us. And they're doing a really good go wide impression here. So plan here is just to march the uh the sprite dragon. I didn't want to play out the EE because I didn't want them knowing about it. I can't march and EE, so doesn't do a whole lot for me either way. Um this underworld breach. My thought was they breach and then they replay like bobble and i just uh march the sprite dragon block the swift spear take two go to two and we try to figure out like next turn we can play kavu hold up stubborn and all fluster storm something like that uh i didn't really think about playing breach and then just like going to combat and breaching the mutagenic growth in combat so now if I go to like block the Swift Spear, march the Sprite Dragon, uh, they get to Mutagenic Growth, one of the Soldier Tokens, and that kills me. So, interesting series there. I don't think there was anything I really could have done differently, but you never know. Game three. Uh, kind of like game one, opening with Survive Triome. Uh, Survive Triome and a bunch of cards you can't cast off Survive Triome, so pretty easy throwback. Uh, second hand, pretty solid. We've got some good interaction. We can throw back the Stubborn Denial again and just keep like a bunch of our uh, removal spells. So, a couple options here. We could go to, like, Lightning Bolt the Soul Scar and hold up Fluster Storm if they go for a, uh, a Mutagenic Growth. We could go for the Leyline Binding and have Fluster Storm. I decide to, to just go for the Tribal Flames. If they have Mutagenic Growth, the Soul Scar still dies. They would have to spend multiple mutagenic growth saving the soul scar. Um, and I get rid of like the worst removal spell in my hand on a one for one basis. So now I can uh, Ren get back Windswept Teeth. I've got Temple Garden in the deck so I can Leyline Binding with that one mana. Uh, I could also get Sacred Foundry so I can Binding or uh, Lightning Bolt. And now that I've picked up a march, I've got a removal spell that takes out something regardless of how big it gets. So now Lightning Bolt has become like my de facto worst removal spell in the, the hand. And this was a, a really interesting situation I did not expect. Um, so opponent has played an underworld breach with two cards, uh, in the graveyard. They've already played their land for turn. So I'm over here, like, what on earth is going on? Like, 
Why are you underworld breaching with no cards in the graveyard to get back? Uh, maybe their hand is like two Mishra's Baubles, but if they go Mishra's Bobble, sack one, cast second Mishra's Bobble, then I could just like ley line binding the underworld breach or something and stop that. So I am so confused here. And then they sack a mountain and mind collapse my Ren and Six. So if you don't know mind collapse, uh, Modern Horizons 2 limited all star. You can sack a mountain rather than pay its four mana mana cost and it deals five damage to a creature or, or planeswalker. Mind Collapse was not on my radar. Uh, I would have, not would have, did forget the card even existed. But either way, uh, they Underworld Breach for a Bobble, so I'm A-OK -okay with that. It's like two mana draw a card. I don't have a Shadow, so not really a reason to be too aggressive with my life total. They just uh, kind of time walked themselves. They sacked a land, breached a, only a bobble. So. Then third path, Iconoclast with no follow up. Uh, would make me think something like Mishra's, or not Mishra's bobble, uh, mutagenic growth here. But no mutagenic growth, so. March this, because March is more expensive than our Leyline Binding right now. Play out a 4-3 uh, a Knight. I thought about gaining the 4 life, but... Probably rather just have the creature out. Uh, this did turn on Lava Dart, which I think is one of the cards that they should be more likely to board out some number of. So playing the odds is kind of fine. Uh, unfortunate mana situation means we can't play out Kavu and hold up Flusterstorm. But we do have Kavu plus hold up Leyline binding. So as long as they don't like double bolt our Kavu right here, we're kind of happy. All right. And then picking up Stubborn Denial is like, we feel great. We've got counter spells. We've got removal spells. We're not planning on. Uh, I decided to go ahead and exile the Lava Dart here since they don't have a mountain and can't flash it back right at the moment. Uh, but I think it's next turn I decide to loot away the Giganta because we're like nowhere near casting that. Which could have been hasty. Like, I really want the fourth land to be able to cast everything at any point and like march for however many i need maybe they play a uh a fable of the mirror breaker in the sideboard or something and i want to march for that but i don't know if they do so i just decided to loot away the giganta keep the land of course the next draw is another land but i can always uh throw away that second land at some point too come on moto Being slow and scraggly. We what is Man, Magic Online uses so much memory it's insane. Got like 32 uh, gigs of RAM and Magic Online's using like 15% of it. <laughs> Which for those of you who don't know, uh, 
a really intensive like computer game we'll say like call of duty or something you can run on like eight gigs of ram uh and be okay so magic online is like running as much as call of duty would on my computer right now which is all right, uh, so they mind collapsed my territorial Kavu. Fine with me. They're down another land. Then they decide to go ahead and use that extra floating mana to bolt me. Uh, probably not the decision you want to make against your opponent's Death Shadow deck. But I don't, I don't think we've shown them Shadow yet. So if we haven't shown them Shadow, then it's probably fine. Like, they just don't expect there to be a big downside to it. But either way, the downside is we have a shadow. Our shadow is backed up by more counter magic than we could possibly need. And I'm thinking their hand is just like a bunch of bolts and stuff. Like, we haven't really given them bolt targets. We played a Renin Six and a Kavu that both got mind collapsed. We played a Knight that they could uh, lava dart. So, I'm really thinking their hand is just a whole bunch of lightning bolts and they're going to try to burn me out here. So. Lava dart's fine. Right, dragon. They've got the mutagenic growth, so we're gonna lay line binding the dragon, and that's game. Could have stubborn denied like the first bolt. Um, wouldn't be the craziest idea in the world. It's really just how how much of this do you think is your opponent? Having it versus reaching. And like, in that case, my opponent had Lightning Bolt and then Lava Dart. So they didn't go like Bolt, Bolt, Untap, Lava Dart. They went Bolt to Lava Dart. So I'm kind of expecting them to not have another Bolt or be trying to play around um, like spell pierce, but if they're playing around spell pierce with only two mana, that means they gotta hope that they untap and draw land, uh, which they can pay for spell pierce on one thing, but they can't cast like recast the lava dart. So I don't think they have the lethal burn. Um, so I'm okay letting those resolve. I think what it is is like bolt bolt or bolt lava dart to try to set up for for something or get me to use my counters or anything in that kind of realm. So going with the plan of um, letting the bolt and lava dart resolve and keeping my counters feels like it's got more upside to me. All right. Round three against Tron Gamer. Not not the kind of name we want to see in the league. Uh, we're on the draw. We can get like breeding pool. We could get. Uh, we don't have a stomping ground in this deck, which you see all of these and think like, oh, well, why don't you have a stomping ground? That's kind of stupid. But stomping ground doesn't cast like Kavu and Ren and Six. You need your red and green on different lands. You don't want uh your red and green on the same land when you're wanting your second land to have two other land types. Um this hand's like not horrendous, but it's not great. So I think the important part is 
We'd have to get like Sacred Foundry to cast Lightning Bolt. I don't want to get Sacred Foundry because it doesn't cast Neshoba Brawler or Kavu. But we are on the draw. But we'll just throw it back. This hand is worse. But I don't really want to go down anymore. Can't cast Thought Seas, but if we are up against Tron, we could like Stubborn Denial a turn to Sylvan Scrying or something. Uh, opponent shows us the weirdest Tron start I've ever seen. Breeding Pool Cycle of Striped River Winder. But if that's the case, like we've got Stubborn Denials, so we can kind of fight over some living in shenanigans. Then I don't want to cast the Brawler and have them just cast a uh, Cascade spell on turn three. So I can wait until my turn three to hold up the Brawl or play the Brawler and hold up the uh, Stubborn and all. The problem is the Brawler is only a 3-3. Three -three. I have no black. And I have no red. That gets both black and red. But we're going to prioritize the second stubborn now. Uh, so I could get the blood crypt there and make the brawler a 5-3. But I really want the extra access to blue more than I want the, uh, uh, the black right now. Having black doesn't change the clock currently. Uh, if this brawler's a 5-3, it's a four-turn clock. If it's a 4-3, it's a four-turn clock. So, We're kind of at the part of the game where Thoughtseize is going to be extremely redundant. Uh, also of note, I got the second blue source. Because if my opponent goes to my turn, casts a Violent Outburst, and I have to counter it, and goes to their turn and casts another Cascade spell, I need to counter it. If they had done like this, where they cast it on their own main phase, and I could untap, then the Black Source would have been better. But I didn't know they were going to cast it on their turn, so... Here we are. Add Gigantha to our hand. I actually found myself adding Gigantha more times in these zoo leagues than I ever have in shadow leagues, which I thought was kind of funny. All right, we're going to march a, a shardless agent because not much else to do. Got to hope they don't have the Cascade spell here. They're going to go to our turn in Cascade. Ooh, the hot draws. Petty theft is A-OK. -okay. I can outrace a brazen borrower pretty well. And I don't know if they're running three living end or four. Uh, but they scoop there. So I assume they're only running three. Maybe they drew the fourth, but I don't really have enough information to like really make a deterministic guess there. Sideboarding. I uh, board out a lot of these spot removal spells that don't kill stuff when it does come back. Uh, tribal Flames, two mana sorcery speed, not great. March, not great. Binding, not great. Uh, boarded in like the two Fluster Storms, the two Teferi, the two Unlicensed Hearse. Um, what else? 
the Lavinia, and the two Veil of Summer, because I think the Veil of Summer have more text than, like, Lightning Bolt. Help fight a counter war, or if they've got like grief. Um, like I wish the hand had a threat, but at the same time, it does have breeding pool, uh, like blood crypt thought sees into breeding pool. We can either hearse or hold up stubborn denial. So we've got the, the pieces to stall for a bit, at least. Even if we do keep drawing tribal flames. All right. So. Very redundant hand. The shardless agent and the violent outburst. They've got the river winder to cycle. I had to to pause for like a couple of minutes here because I really wasn't sure what I wanted to take. So my thoughts are this. I don't really care about the subtlety right now. Like it doesn't stop the hearse, doesn't stop stubborn denial, whatever. Uh, the shardless agent and the violent outburst are very redundant. So if I'm going to take a Cascade spell, I'm going to take the Violent Outburst, because at least I can like force them to shard this agent on their turn. Um, but if I've got the Hearse down and it's doing some work, then I don't really care about either of the Cascade spells. They only have one land, but they have a Free Cycler and Street Wraith and another Cycler and Riverwinder. So I think I end up taking the Street Wraith here so that maybe there's a chance that they miss the third land drop for a turn. And if they don't, uh, I know that I can play out Hearse, eat two of the three creatures, and I've got Tribal Flames for the third. Oh, take the Outburst. What was my reasoning for... I guess... Taking Outburst was... Taking Street Wraith is trying to mana screw them. Taking Outburst is... I don't want you to be able to respond to my Unlicensed Hearst activation with a Cascade spell. So it's kind of interesting how I convince myself like the other way a little bit as this match is going on. Like if I take the Street Wraith, they've got three looks at a land. They've got the draw for the next turn, cycle off Riverwinder, draw for the turn after that. And any cyclers that they find make that a little extra... Violent Outburst is probably correct, so that they have to... Okay, that's what I was thinking here. Uh, taking Violent Outburst and playing the Unlicensed Hearse means they are effectively locked into having to play the Shardless Agent right now. Uh, because every turn that they wait, it gets worse with Unlicensed Hearse. So they need to cascade right now while they have like minimum graveyard presence. Hearse can eat a couple things, so they're left with one creature. If they find another blue spell, they can evoke subtlety for nothing and get that back. But I can fight over two creatures. So that's what it was, is I wanted to make them have a, uh, a suboptimal living end here. So they do go with the Evoke Subtlety just to get another creature back. Oh, stop it. Stop it. Alright, a lot skipped over there. So, <laughs> we... Vi or we Tribal Flames the Subtlety 
we ley line binding these uh, straight wraith, and now we've just got this shardless agent to contend with. We unlicensed her, ate the subtlety that they played, and just something else. Didn't really matter what. Uh, they attacked us for two. Then we added Dragantha to our hand and passed back. That's where we're at now. So it'd be a lot easier if Moto didn't like open up separate windows every time something interacted with the graveyard. The little rake, waker waves and river winder. It's like a couple things we can exile. All right, so they've got two living ends, shardless agent, violent outburst. Uh, this time I take the shardless agent because I don't want just another two two body on board, and that's basically the only reason. Like, they scooped after I dealt with three living ends game one. So, I'm thinking that they probably only have uh, three in the deck. Again, I don't play living in, so I don't know if three or four is uh, is standard. But I don't want to activate Hearse blindly just in case they have, like, they drew double Street Wraith or they cycle Street Wraith, find a Street Wraith, and then Violent Outburst if they have a fourth living end. So that's why you see me, like, attacking with the Gigantha, not attacking with the Unlicensed Hearse, is that was, like, the one turn I was shields down. Uh, go ahead and get rid of the petty theft there. So even if they do like violent outburst into another living end, I can still uh, race that with Gigantha. And then here we decide to crew and go for the lethal because I've got the stubborn denial. And turns out they did have a fourth living end. Which luckily we were prepared for that. Um, but it just, it's a good example of like, even when you think you have perfect information, you can still be wrong. Like they scooped again game one after we dealt with the third living end. So it would give the suggestion that they only have three in the deck. But like right there, if we had played around or if we played uh, too aggressively into third living in, we could have lost. But because we or played too aggressively into them only having three living ins, we could have lost. But because we played around it, we didn't have to play into uh, them not having a fourth living in. We could play around it. Turns out they did have the fourth living in, and we got to win anyway. So, just don't be too, uh, too focused on, I have to make an action. If that makes any sense. All right, pavement is rad seven. I guess pavement's all right. Uh, opening hand, double ragavan that we can't cast. Two one to Shova Brawler is pretty rough. This is much better. We can just throw back one of these shocks. Now we've got like turn one, sacred foundry ragavan, turn two, Ren, turn three, shadow. Uh, 
on it on basic island um okay <laughs> if you want to be um next level in your magic assessment um uh, I would not advise this at actual events, but I think it's kind of funny when it comes up in a situation like this. Um, our opponent plays Basic Island Pass. They are playing a Lorwyn Basic Island. If you played during Lorwyn Block, these Basic Islands, or these Basic Lands in general, are fantastic. Like, you know how great they look. Lorwyn basic lands show up in tribal decks so often. Like, people who play fairies play Lorwyn basic islands and swamps. Merfolk, uh, a lot of players play Lorwyn basic islands. I've seen a lot of goblins players play Lorwyn basics. Because Lorwyn's like the tribal thing. So you could make the guess here that our opponent is on something like Merfolk or fairies or something similar because they played a Lorwyn basic island and they are in fact on Murpho. <laughs> so I did not make that assumption during the game because again I do not recommend like changing how you're playing because you assume your opponent's on a specific deck because of you saw a certain type of basic island because it's very easy to just say, oh, I like the look of that island. But just know that the, the possibility is there. So I feel like if I resolve my opponent's file in on turn two, I'm in fantastic shape. Uh, unfortunately, my opponent does not want me resolving their file in on turn two. So it gets subtletyed back onto the top of their library. Which is unfortunate because I really wanted that spy Olin. Alright, so Ren can get back Foothills. Foothills gets Blood Crypt and that gets us a Shadow down. It's got the ability to resolve their spile in here. We've got the ability to attack. I've got the backup Ragavan, so like I can choose not to attack with the Ragavan and uh and just sit back with it. Then this other Ragavan goes dead. If I attack, three options happen. Uh, option number one, they block with Spile and Ragavan dies. It's whatever. But I don't think they're going to throw this file in front of it because it's a really high likelihood that I've got things like Lightning Bolt in my deck. I could have Ren down, Ren down tick, second Ren down tick. Uh, number of things that could go wrong and they just invested three mana into this file and so it's like a pretty big deal to keep it around uh so that option is unlikely then the other two options are it trades with the trickster in which case i just get to play a backup ragavan or it hits my opponent and i get a card off their deck and a treasure token and like both of those are pretty great options for me so if I get to just trade in a Ragavan for a Trickster, like, cool. And decide not to play out the Ragavan to kind of hide it. Maybe if my opponent plays differently, if they don't know, I can just dash another Ragavan next turn. I was kicking myself for a second here for getting back windswept teeth instead of wooded foothills because I was thinking, okay, well, the only shocks windswept teeth can get are Foundry Breeding Pool Overgrown Tomb, uh, where wooded foothills could get um, steam vents. So 
if I wanted to rend down tick, I couldn't also fetch and shock with uh, the windswept heath to make two creatures lethal. And then I remembered, oh yeah, I added a temple garden to the deck. So as a matter of fact, I can fetch and shock. Did not have Fidelian Hexcatcher on my uh, radar there either. One of these new inclusions. So I decided to fetch and shock here uh, so that I can present lethal with e any of these shadows next turn. So they have to triple block. Um, by killing the Lord, I shrink Tvalon back down to a three, which means I'm not dead to double Lord on their side. So, pack here, uh, to me, means they either have or they're looking for, like, Merfolk Trickster. So I could absolutely lose to double trickster or single trickster here. The trickster would uh, flash in, tap down one of these shadows, and then tide shaper and shadow could block the other one or the other two. But drawing leyline binding means I'm not dead to a trickster here. And they just didn't have it. Um, either that or they accidentally skipped through the inner combat step. Either one. Sneak away with game one. Alright, so sideboarding against Merfolk. Boarding out all these stubborn denials. Uh, boarding in engineered explosives. I boarded in the Night of Autumn just as like another threat. Hit an Aether Vial, hit a Relic, Chalice of the Void, something like that they might bring in. Um, also just like a okay body. And I brought in the two Teferis. It helps fight through like Tricksters and Harbinger of the Tides. Um, as well as like resetting Aether Vials. If I'm trading one for one with guys, it can just be like a big tempo swing to get like a Tvialin or something off the board. Uh, there's a little flexibility there. One of the changes I did make going to game three uh, is I think I brought out the Teferis and brought in Veil of Summer. Kind of the same idea, like, hey, you can stop a Trickster target, a Harbinger bounce, uh, something like that that's a really big tempo swing on their side. I don't know if either of them is right. But I at least wanted to try them out. Uh, five lands, got to ship that back. Three lands, thought season to brawler with a march. Like it's not exciting, but it's better than the five lander. Do have an aether vial, so we get thought season on one. Scalding tarn can find us. Uh, Sacred Foundry on two to be able to like march the Aether Vial. So we see Trickster. We take that because it just kills like Territorial Kavu straight up. We don't want that happening. Uh, the hope here is that our opponent misses two land drops. They miss this turn and they miss next turn. That way we can like march the Aether Vial, and then get a threat down next turn, and we can start attacking first. So, like, if we get some of our threats out on the front foot, then we're in an okay spot, but if they start snowballing creatures, then it's pretty rough, which, of course, they find the land immediately. Keep a one lander with a vial, don't get punished. I 
I also did not, um, I did not realize that Rashad and Doc Hand had uh, Island Walk, or I might have played some of this a little bit differently. Like, I knew they could get a Lord at some point in Island Walk, and that's fine. But I didn't think about them just like having an Island Walk creature naturally. Chalice of the Void. Got a bolt before that. Hang us for one. Shadow into a Chalice of the Void is not the uh, the most effective threat. So we're dead to double lord. Harbinger bounce file and back to their hand. Seems good. So I thought about Teferi here. Just like Teferi bounce a, a Harbinger or something. But what I'm kind of hoping is if they just spend this turn replaying Sviolin, uh, then we can play Teferi, bounce this Sviolin, and swing for lethal. But unfortunately, they find the Lord. Uh, they're able to Lord up the Dock Hand, which, again, I did not even know had just normal Island Walk. Things you learn. But like I mentioned, I think this Game 3, yeah, swapped out the Teferi's, board in the Veil of Summers, Kind of like against humans. When humans used to be popular, I uh, a lot of times board in a Veil of Summer to cause it stops like Reflector Mage triggers. Um, or it stopped Freebooter. Something else. But a lot of times it was just better than like Stubborn Denial. So, all right, so. Basic planes looking a little awkward here. Not like the worst in the world, but. Okay, so. Important spot here that I punted. We've got. A few options. Uh, option number one would be just like planes march the tide shaper attack with ragavan uh and then use the treasure to like thought seize or we can just hold the treasure till next turn to be able to rent or kavu or something uh option number two is attack in with the ragavan offer up the trade option number three is just play the planes and pass and i kind of did like the worst case of all of those which was to play the planes and just like march the tide shaper on their instep mainly because i just forgot that tide shaper was a one drop for some reason so i could have been going into this next turn with a treasure token like i could have chosen not to thought seize go into this next turn with a treasure token and I would have been really, really great shape from here with a treasure token. Uh, so the reason being is they wouldn't have the Tide Shaper. I could attack in with the Ragavan. If they want to block, cool. If they don't want to block, cool. Whatever. Uh, Wooded Foothills can get Overgrown Tomb and play out the Kavu. Uh, and I could use like the treasure token to Thought Seize to protect the Kavu from, like, a trickster. But because I'm going into this with less mana, I decide to go for the Renin 6. 
so that next turn I can for sure Kavu plus Thoughtseize. Be and it was because of the fear of Merfolk Trickster. I didn't want to lose my Ragavan and then also lose my Kavu uh, and just have like no threat with a Ren and no way to deal with a creature on board. And it turns out they had Dismember, but they didn't have Trickster. But either way, Thoughtseize could have taken Dismember, which is fine. But the important thing is I would have been attacking with a Territorial Kavu on this turn instead of just playing it out, which is a huge distinction. And the reason for that distinction is I start drawing into things like Veil of Summer that could have cycled. Uh, I draw into Lightning Bolt here that could have killed a Lord last turn. So I could have like killed a Lord, blocked this violin with uh, Territorial Kavu. I mean, I know I'd already attacked, so not the important part. Important part is would have been a turn ahead on everything. So here I'm just like hoping my opponent will cast something so I can cycle Veil of Summer, maybe find another piece of interaction. But they do not, and I die. And I'm pretty sure I drew the next card, and it was like a Leyline Binding. So if I had gotten the Kavu online a turn sooner and started looting a turn sooner, I would have found like Bolt and Leyline Binding a turn sooner. And we might have been okay. No guarantee, but it would have been a better position than we were. And that all happened because I didn't march the, um, the Tide Shaper and start attacking and get the mana, like, I didn't prioritize fixing my mana on the first couple of turns. I prioritized, like, holding up in case they have a, I don't know, a Aether Vial or something that didn't matter. Alright, so, match five. We are currently three and one in the league. Uh, if this were on the draw, maybe, but on the play, really need our mana to function. Uh, on the play with the Ragavan's a lot better. Throw back one of these tribal flames. Opponent has mulligan to at least five. Looks like five exactly. Down Ragavan can feed Blood Crypt so that I can Thought Seize. And then this game, I'm not going to make the same mistake. Like, you draw a card, cool. Like, I'm getting my mana uh, going. Which is also why I don't Thought Seize there. So that I can, like, hold up Tribal Flames next turn. If I had another land, I could Thought Seize plus something. Which we do. So now this... Um, Wooded Foothills can get a Temple Garden, which lets us Leyline Binding for two instead of some absurd amount. The Blacksmith skill, because I don't really care about the... I don't care about them getting another hammer if I've just got Leyline Binding. And what is the best possible card that we could draw in this situation? That's right, kids. It is March of Otherworldly Light. Looking like an all-star right here because we can just exile this Urza Saga. Adjigantha. Stoneforge doesn't do anything for us there.
down Shova Brawler while they kind of work on fixing their mana. And uh, I forgot for a second. Uh, I knew they had the Nettle Cyst, but I kind of forgot about them flashing it in with Zagarda's Aid. But either way, like we've got Leyline Binding. Uh, so I make sure here to Binding with the Living Weapon trigger on the stack so that they can't use the germ to like make mana off Springleaf Drum and maybe have like a Blacksmith skill or something. And now it's kind of like, oh, is their last card a hammer? Uh, which I think we knew they had a hammer because they steal Shaper's Gift. But either way, we attack, they block. Hammers happen. And we just travel flames for lethal. Um, they're showing there. Game two. Sideboarding, boarding out some number of these stubborn denial, like against all the creature part of it. They're pretty bad. They're okay at trading one for one with like Sigarda's Aid, uh, Hammers, Nettle Cyst, Blacksmith Skill, anything like that. Uh, but on the draw, when they can't hit Sigarda's Aid on turn one, they get substantially worse. Poured out a bunch of Ragavans because they got so many zero and one drop guys. It's just like. Stonewall Ragavan. Board in EE, e. board in Knight of Autumn. So two wear tear, EE, e. Knight of Autumn, and Alpine Moon to help fight over like uh sagas or ink moth nexus, something like that. Opening hand is meh. Like it's, it would be better on the play than the draw because of Ragavan on one. Uh, we do have Wear and Tear, but we don't have a second land. So I'm pretty inclined to throw this back. This is a little bit better. We've got Bolt into Neshoba Brawler. Usually a big fan of throwing back shock lands when we've got like more than two lands because you want to be fetching up your shock lands anyway. You could also see throwing back the second shadow pretty easily. But I kind of figure if I'm drawing spells, that's live. If I'm drawing uh, creatures, that's live. If I'm drawing lands, that's live. So. No hammer there is nice. I found myself getting this Sacred Foundry Overgrown Tomb combination a lot more than I thought I would. Uh, but as long as they don't have, like, double hammer here, I'm not in some un losable situation or unwinnable situation. Joba Brawler's not doing anything for me on defense, so I might as well attack. Leyline Binding is an excellent pickup. Like, I'm fine offering up this trade. If they want to lose the Esper Sentinel, awesome. So I'm going to make them make the first move. Like, if they trade with the Shadow, I just play a second Shadow, and I'm like, great. No problem. Then Pithing Needle naming Engineered Explosives. 
Um, I get EE being a consideration. I don't know. I don't know if it's the most impactful name right now. Because, like, EE on zero taking out Saga tokens is a pretty big deal. So, I'm not... I don't think the decision to name it is, like, wrong. But the other option for EE is one that kind of neuters my clock. And there's no way I'm doing that. So, I guess it's fine. Like, you can pretty well guess I've got EE somewhere in the deck, so. Probably better than I'm giving it credit for. Um, so, play out Shadow here so that I could um, just, like, Tribal Flames down to one and Bolt next turn or something. But I decided to play out the Shadow, hold up the Bolt, so if they have, like, I don't know, Ginger Brew Hammer or something, I can respond to that. But it looks like it's just strap up a pure steel. In which case, we are just going to uh, have a fitting into the league with the Tribal Flames. And opponent said uh said nothing but kind words here. Great sport. Loved everything our deck was offering. All right. So back to the deck list. Uh ended up the league four and one. Deck felt decent. Some of the positives of that league is like Neshoba Brawler was better than I thought it would be. So I was pretty pleased with that one. Uh, Kava was good. Ragavan was good. Shadow was good. Uh, Stubborn and Album we weren't against like Merfolk was good. Ren was okay. I don't know if there's really like a card in that flex spot I'd be thrilled with, but Ren's fine. Barge of Otherworldly Light was fantastic. Um, got the hit Urza Saga. We like ran over um, what's it called? Prowess with it. I was really impressed with March. Tribal Flames, like I mentioned earlier in the video, as a finish off burn spell. I think it's like a, a B plus. Like, it's still sorcery speed for 5 damage. You could play, like, Boros Charm for instant speed 4 damage. You could play Lightning Helix for instant speed 3, gain 3. Um, and all those, I think, are, like, better overall. Uh, as a removal spell, I still think it's horrendous. Like, C- is what I said about it earlier. I don't think that's really changed. If you're expecting a bunch of things like Merfolk in your uh, local meta, then maybe it gets a bump up to like C+. But ultimately, I don't see it being above a C grade as a removal spell. As a removal spell. Uh, the flexibility of being able to go face or go to a creature, Planeswalker, whatever, I think gives it like a, a B- minus overall. It's fine. It's it's a known quantity at this point. Um, two mana, five damage most of the time. Two dam two mana, four damage a lot of times. Is it's whatever. But the sorcery speed part, I think, is like the worst thing about the card by a mile. Um, in the sideboard, Veil of Summer didn't really do anything. Lavinia, most of these were just kind of whatever. Wear and tear if you see a bunch of matchups that you wanted in. I can see being really good. Um, I think Night of Autumn for the flexibility is like a little bit better than these others. 
but I could easily see adding a couple a couple extra removal spells somewhere in the sideboard. Uh, something to help fight against creatures out of decks like Merfolk, out of um, Hammer Time, Merc Tide, whatever. Maybe like Prismatic Ending needs a space. But honestly, like March of Otherworldly Light is hit everything that I would be hitting with Prismatic Ending while being better because it hits like Urza's Saga. So I kind of want to play March before I play Prismatic Ending. And yeah, I guess that's about it. So do this video on YouTube. Thanks for stopping by. Otherwise, I hope, uh, hope you're able to catch a live stream. And adios for now.